Having worked on all second rank tensors in this class up till now, we're going to introduce a property which is um, results in a third rank tensor just to academically introduce you to uh, another world, even though many, many useful tensors are, are second ranked. And we've seen how a second rank tensor comes from uh, a vector in three dimensions acting on a material producing essentially a uh, displacement that has um, a, a vector. It's a vector displacement. And then we said, aha, actually, um, you know, some of these second rank tensors can be the applied uh, a force and you get an, um, a field a tensor. So it's not a property tensor but it's a field tensor. And we had two field tensors that we'll come back to in a minute, which were stress and strain. And uh, then finally we had a second rank tensor that actually was linked to a field tensor, epsilon, but it was linked through a scalar, right? So hopefully that's a nice little, we're collecting a little, um, uh, garden of different genotypes for you to understand uh, what's happening here. Uh, so now we're going to add another one, which is third ranked. A lot of people like to talk about how important piezoelectricity is, blah, blah, blah. The truth is piezoelectricity is really, really important in, in a very, very few areas. It's a very useful um, a property that's been used, especially in older electronics and things like that. It's still important but its uh, importance decreases every day as we advance um, other kinds of electronics. But there still is a useful, um, a lot of times, useful property of being able to apply stress and get a predictable amount of electricity, not electricity, charge formed on surfaces uh, from that response. So. You know, I would say that, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you how important Pio's electricity is. It is an interesting effect. For material scientists, of course, it's very important in the development of atomic force microscopes and things like that. However, um, its real purpose here in our class is that it's, an, it's, an, it's a good example of third rank tensor. As we go up in the ranks, there aren't as many important properties. And so, uh, you know, it's... Um, it's a good example of a third rank tensor with um, a reasonable application space. So uh, just to remind you, we've already covered this before. A general thing about um, uh, dipoles, we saw this in um, our uh, description of dielectric constant because that was linked ultimately uh, unbound, uh, sorry, bound charge charge bound to atoms and it's fixed in space they can still be distorted even though there's a restoring force and uh, we we talked about that and here um, we're also talking about about fixed charge that is um, in these materials uh, this is charged is attached to ions and uh, just to review quickly we define a dipole as charge Q operating over some distance D. So D is the vector connecting the two uh, charges, plus Q minus Q. So the absolute value of Q times that distance is, uh, is defined as the polarization. And so what happens is, you know, if you have one of these guys, a dipole, let's say our little example here, uh, and it's in a some sort of electric field, right? Uh, it's going to try to align. There's going to be forces to try to align this dipole um, uh, in this electric field, right? And so those are real torques. Those are real forces and everything else. And that's a definition of uh, a dipole. So in a material, you can picture a material having... Uh, as we had discussed in a previous lecture, um, 
you know, these little dipoles, you can imagine them in an ionic material as the ions, for example, if you're looking at ionic polarizability, and, and I can distort the clouds around them by placing this in electric field. What that looks like it does is it looks like it creates charge on a surface and then a negative charge on the bottom surface. Now remember that Maxwell's equations does this in a way that um, uh, this looks experimentally like the charge appears on the surface. But remember, there actually is, you know, in a general form Maxwell's equation, I could have real charge on the surface, or it could be this induced charge from the fact that I have lots of uh, little dipoles that can be polarized throughout the volume of this, but it still looks like uh, charge. And of course, that's the principle of putting a material inside a capacitor. Um, I can have all the little dipoles in the volume add up and create essentially uh, induced charge on the surface, which can then interact with true free charge, which is on the parallel, place, parallel plate capacitors. So this is something that always confuses students, and it's really the nature. If you look at the math, the way that the um, uh, the um, the equations are for Maxwell's uh, Maxwell's equations. They're set up with a symmetry that, uh, in displacement, uh, you have a dielectric constant in a field, right? And so uh, uh, there again, you have uh, a field tensor at the response, which is called displacement, and actually uh, inside epsilon. It depends on how you write it, but uh, this is related to both the... Uh, and the way to think about total polarization P, it's uh, related to uh, the number of little dipoles I have per volume, and that relates to big P, and then in Maxwell's equations, that comes out to be a surface-related uh, type phenomena. It could be real charge on the surface, or it could be these little dipole moments through the volume, which then essentially induce, uh, look like they're inducing charge on, on the surfaces. Okay, so uh, enough of that, but this P, is essentially the polarization is the big property that we're we're after in our current mission of Pierre's electricity because it's this overall polarization on the material that we're interested in as we apply uh, stress. So P here is a vector. So you can already see why this is going to be interesting because as we know, stress is um, a tensor and it's a field tensor right so what that means is that i need to have a new proportionality oops and i made a mistake already so Here we're going to have a second rank tensor related to a vector through a third rank tensor. So Dijk uh, is, th this is known as, by the way, the direct piezoelectric effect. And that's how we end up with a third rank tensor, is that we must allow the stress in all directions, not just the one we're looking in towards P, in order to contribute to that. Because you could have uh, these little dipoles being affected by stresses in all directions, even though um, some of those stresses are not normal, or so, sorry, parallel 
to the direction of uh, polarization. And so that's why you end up with a third rank tensor is, that, is really that the, um, uh, the generalized force itself is a tensor, uh, which creates the need for a third rank tensor to relate to a vector. Now we're going to find out in stress and strain, of course, is I have a second rank, second rank. And so compliance and stiffness ends up being a fourth rank tensor. All right, so we're just building up our toolkit of examples of materials properties, and hopefully you can uh, see how this uh, has evolved. So what this means, of course, is that the more uh, the, the more of these that you have, the more complicated it gets. Um, let's if I have a second rank tensor, and I have nine components in it. You know, sigma one one, sigma one two, sigma one three, sigma two two, etc. And then I have uh, a vector. As you know, there's three there. That means that there's 27 you know, DIJK. So this is getting, you know, getting to be a bit uh, unwieldy, right? So, uh, for example, just so you can tell that if I start, uh, if I say P1, right, remember what that looks like. That means that that equals uh, D111 one, 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 sigma 1 1 plus D 1 2 2 sigma 2 2 plus you know etc and don't forget you're gonna have uh, you know nine terms since there's nine sigmas right and then I'm gonna have uh, you know two more of, of these as well so let me tell you about a little way that um, when you're working within a particular coordinate system, and that's the key, when you are working in a particular coordinate system, there's an abbreviation that people use, and you should be aware of it because it's also used with stress and strain, which is that um, uh, the, the many, many type of, if you think about this, and I'm looking at P1, and I have D1, 1, 1, 1, sigma, 1, 1, and then I'm going on and on with these terms. It turns out that these two, of course, are always going with these two, right? And so there's a, a tendency to say, ah, you know, why am I writing down um, all these ones? And the answer is, of course, well, because if I'm in a particular coordinate system and I want to do transformations, that's why. But let's suppose that I'm not in the, I'm not worrying about transformations. I just want to, you know, look at sigma and P and D and I'm not transforming anything. Uh, we're going to also use this. Um, this is also used in stress and strain. And what it means is that... Um, I can do the following. Instead of writing these always out, what I can do is relabel this guy first as sigma 1. And then what I do is I move in this direction. And then this guy is sigma 2. This guy is sigma 3. Then I go up here. This is sigma 4, this is sigma 5, and this is sigma 6. So this transforms into as I said, you've probably seen this. You probably have seen this. And that allows you to then up here, of course, this could be written as sigma 1, and this could be written as d1, 1, 1. So very nice condensation uh, of, of the notation. The only problem, of course, 
uh, well, well, before I, I stop this, you should know, you probably notice if you're the astute observer here, that there becomes a problem uh, when I hit terms like in P1, when I'm going through and describing that, you know, uh, we started now, we're going to have D11 sigma 1 plus, but remember what happens, I'm going to have two terms because I've gotten rid of of the distinguishing feature, I've, I've you know, in, in a sense, my notation has gone to higher symmetry. I'm actually going to end up with two uh, one four sigma four. And even when I do that, you see what I'm assuming is that d one four equals d one three two plus d one two three right so or actually i'm assuming i guess two d one four is equal to d one one three two plus d one two three right so essentially i'm assuming that these guys are the same and uh I can add them because I'm going to end up with two different terms. Remember, in the original thing, I had d one three two sigma three two plus d uh, one two three sigma two three. So in the new dotation, when I call, uh, remember, this is going to be four. When I call this four, and I want to call this four, uh, this is going to have to become four, and this is going to have to become four. And if I can assume that this equals two d one four, then I'm in business, right? And so that's what you do. So you got factors of two problems when you go into this. Uh, mode. So uh, the only thing is just remember that uh, if you go into this mode, and there, this is not specific to PO's electricity, we're just using PO's electricity as an example. As you go up into these higher rank tensors, you're going to want to condense a notation. You condense a notation, that's fine. You can go ahead and use this. Um, and of course, uh, don't forget this means that, of course, you can look at this as a uh, a big long vector now. Right, so you can write this as a vector if you want, and the big difference here is this is a matrix. It is no longer a tensor. It's not related through this coordinate system to these other properties, right? So I've converted it into a system that works. You know, I have a vector sigma related through a uh, a matrix uh, D, which goes to you know P, which is an output. But uh, this is no longer a physical quantity, and that means that uh, you cannot transform this. So you have to rotate, you have to go back. If you're going to use this notation, you have to go back into the full notation in order to transformation of axes and things like that.